I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. Hi, this is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Christian Roth of DD Diesel. I'm Braden Fleece, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. On today's episode, we have a special guest. His name is Brendan Morrison, and he is a former NHL player. He played for a long time, had a successful career. You might remember him from the Vancouver Canucks, New Jersey Devils, Chicago Blackhawks, the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. He's going to be joining us today. And he is currently the host of a TV show called Real West Coast. And they're heading into their fifth year, and he goes on fishing adventures, and they're catching amazing fish. So if you're into fishing, the stuff that he catches and the places he goes are amazing. I want to encourage you guys, after you listen to this episode, you need to go find Real West Coast on YouTube. They're also on Amazon Prime. And subscribe. And if you're into fishing like I am, you're going to get lost in those episodes, the amazing content, the views, the techniques they use. It's really cool stuff. And I'm going to ask him some questions about... Definitely about hockey. I'm a huge hockey fan, so there's probably going to be a few, few uh, curveballs I throw him with uh, some some hockey questions. But really wanted to jump into fishing the outdoors and then the equipment that he uses. And he's got a Dodge uh, Ram Cummins fourth gen truck, and wanted to ask him about that and how it helps him with what he's doing with his TV show and going on these adventures, towing his boat, trailer, anything like that. Before we get to the episode, though, we want to encourage you guys that it was spring right around the corner in summer and these outdoor adventures we're chatting about to make sure if you're looking to get control over your transmission temperatures to check out Mishimoto just go to Mishimoto.com you can check out the full lineup of products that they have and for our shop owners out there we know that uh, you know the busy season's coming up once spring happens and and people are getting tax return money back you're gonna have a ton more customers coming into your shop wanting product needing their trucks fixed make sure and check out turn 14 distribution you can go on their site sign up if you're not already signed up and they'll get an account manager to be able to help you and they're they're dedicated to diesel so they're going to know the brands and the things that you're looking for they'll get you taken care of all right let's get to the podcast with brendan and talking about hockey fishing and diesel trucks brendan welcome to the diesel podcast this is a really exciting episode where i get to chat about three of my favorite things which are diesel trucks fishing and hockey so it's a it's a, a hat trick, I guess you could say, with uh, the topics we got planned today. <laughs> that That is a natural hat trick for sure. <laughs> I wanted to uh, to start, you know, for our audience, we've got a lot of different diesel enthusiasts that, that listen. And, you know, they could be Ram or Ford or, you know, GM owners. And some of them are, are into racing. Some of them are into the outdoors. And I wanted to have you just explain a little bit about your background in in the nhl and sports and and then from there we'll you know jump into the fishing and the outdoors and that kind of stuff yeah absolutely well thanks thanks for having me on it's uh it's a pleasure to be here to be able to chat with you about these things and uh yeah for me i i guess you know i, I grew up here in in the lower mainland of uh of british columbia just outside of vancouver and started playing hockey at the young age of five which is kind of what a lot of canadian canadian kids do it's just uh it's almost like religion up here. That's uh, what everybody does. But, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to progress, uh, through minor hockey into uh, junior A tier two hockey. And then I, I got a scholarship to the university of Michigan and, and completed all four years of schooling there. And then, uh, turned pro after that and, uh, w- was drafted by the New Jersey devils and, and, uh, traded to my hometown Vancouver Canucks and played there for eight years. And, and those would probably be the most most memorable years of, of my career, just uh, with the success of of the teams that I played on, and and I had great line mates, and uh, it was a super fun time getting to play in front of my family and friends, and continued on, played for a couple more teams after that, and and uh, had a pro career of, of fifteen years. So um, sounds like a long time, but it goes by in a blink of an eye, and and. Uh, I guess now I've kind of moved on to some other things and, and one of them being, uh, being fishing. And I've always been a, a fishing enthusiast, kind of caught the bug a little bit more in my, in my teens, I guess, early twenties. And now it's a, it's a passion that we've kind of morphed into, uh, a, a bit of a livelihood. So that's, uh, that's exciting stuff. I remember just growing up here in Denver, we didn't have a professional hockey team when I was growing up and I got into high school and all of a sudden 
the Quebec Nordiques moved to Colorado and we knew they, they were kind of a good team, but we, you know, we didn't know very much. It was just like, you know, hockey was out there, but we weren't as familiar with it. And then all of a sudden just this frenzy took over in the mid nineties. And it was just, it was really interesting to learn the sport and just to be able to appreciate how different it was than say football or baseball or some of the things that we had seen. And it was, it quickly became one of my favorite sports and, and it was, it, it still is something that I, that I enjoy watching. And, and I remember, you know, I've, I've watched your TV show for a long time and to be able to see the, the outdoor side of it was also something that not just struck me, but I think a lot of diesel truck owners that are out there is we're using our trucks for towing something or taking a boat someplace or fifth wheel. And there's so much, there's so many things I want to do with fishing. I don't know where exactly to start with this, but I know you guys have a ton of different adventures and, and things that you do. And I wanted to ask really what, what drew you to fishing initially, or when did it become sort of a, a passion or a, a, a release that, that you thought I, I really like to do this in my, my spare time? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Like I, I remember like Growing up, my, my parents grew, grew up back uh, in Ontario, but my mom and dad moved out to British Columbia in 19, 1974. So uh, I remember my grandfather, when he would visit from Ontario when I was a young kid, and he was a huge outdoorsman. He, he liked to fish and he liked to hunt. And uh, every time he'd come out, he would always take me fishing. And a lot of times we would go to a local trout farm you know, which essentially is, you know, catching fish in a barrel. But as a young kid, I didn't know any better. And, and we'd go there with, with my grandfather and, and uh, you know, basically catch as, as, as many fish as you want over the course of the time you're there. And, and I thought it was phenomenal. It was a huge adrenaline rush. And it kind of built from there. Like my, my dad enjoys to fish, you know, to this day, probably more so now than when I was younger. But I think that's a lot lot to do with just kind of spending quality time together so my dad never really you know pushed it on me or or or, you know took me fishing all that much it's just something that I kind of grew into I guess my dad always jokes that the gene kind of skipped a generation but you know my late teens early 20s when I was in college and and I have a little maybe a little bit more free time and uh, when I turn turn pro typically the season you know you you play from September and until you know depending on how you do the end of uh, April regular season playoffs can go into June but you know for me I, at first I kind of found it as an escape like just to kind of decompress and just get away from everything and, and just kind of uh, disconnect if you will like no electronics you know no phones ringing no computers none of that stuff just you know something you can do by yourself but it's also something that you can do with you know your your buddies or your family and uh, you know I I've just grown to love it more and more. And, I, and, I, and again, I think the, the big word for me is, is kind of just disconnecting and uh, just really a- appreciating the adventure of it. And um, there's so many different types of, of fishing, obviously. I mean, you your salt water, your fresh water, your lakes, your, your rivers. There's so many different ways to attack it. And, but each way, to me, it's an adventure. You're always learning something new. You know, you're, uh, you know, I kind of describe it to people as it's almost like a meditation, just being outside, you know, taking in your surroundings. Yes, catching a fish is a big part of it. To me, that's, I always describe people to people like that's, that's the adrenaline rush for me. Like, you know, it's, it's a big change going from playing professional sports when, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, under a microscope all the time and, 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 you know, you have the adrenaline of the crowd. And when you leave that kind of atmosphere, I mean, there's, there's, there's very few things out there that, that can replace that. And for me, fishing has been one of them. It's a huge adrenaline rush to me. It, it, it can be competitive, um, but it also acts as an escape. And, and I think those things combined of why I've really fallen in love with it. That, that really just, I couldn't have said it better myself. As a kid, it was much the same way where my father loved to fish and you know, we'd get up at three or four in the morning and we'd leave the city and go to the middle of the mountains and just being disconnected from everything. And there's just, there's water and you have the bait and you know, a boat and you're just out there and it's so quiet. And then 
as a kid, you know, you have the fun of catching, catching the fish and, and everything. And it always stuck with me. And I didn't do it for a really long time until I got older where now there's so many ways we're connected with social media and our phones and all this stuff. And it's just so nice sometimes to go someplace where there's no cell phone service. I don't have to worry about what emails I'm getting or, or, or anything like that. And it's just me with a fishing rod and a reel and bait and the patience of it. And and there's a lot of lessons I think to be learned through fishing and patience was definitely one that, uh, that I learned is, you know, you go out there and you want to catch the fish, but sometimes, sometimes they don't bite. Sometimes you don't get any. And it's just appreciating everything else that's going on with it. And it's just, it's something that, uh, is a release for me as well. So I definitely identify with, with what you were just talking about. Yeah, man. Like for me, it, it's, you know, it's kind of, we, we did a trip this past year where we, we did a fly fishing trip on a, on a Stillwater Lake up outside of Kamloops, um, called the Hyheum. And, you know, one of the things we talked about there was like, this is just like back to basics, man. Like just everything's just simplified. Everything's just, you know, kind of dumbed down, you know, you, you're, you're cooking over an open fire, you're hanging out with a couple buddies, you know, you're listening to like loons on the lake, you know, you're watching stars in the sky. I mean, all that stuff, man, it, 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 when you experience it, it it's, uh, it's addicting. You had mentioned the, the adrenaline rush and the different types of fishing that there are. Is there a particular one that, that is your favorite or do they each have different aspects to them where you appreciate the, the lake, the stream, the salt water? Oh, geez. Like, honestly, I, I appreciate them all. Like e- each fish is so unique and, and, uh, and depending on, again, if you're fishing in salt for salmon or halibut or lingcod, um, you know, on, on rivers, uh, or lakes for trout, steelhead, it's just to me, I mean, maybe if I did pick one to be the absolute ultimate experience, Oh, it's very, very difficult, but I would probably say, uh, fly fishing for tarpon on the fly. And you're, you're, you're basically sight casting for these fish in you know, three to kind of five feet of water, your guides kind of pulling the boat along. What you hope for is no wind and no clouds in the sky. So there's no ripple on the water. It's super hot out and in, and the, you'll spot a fish, you know, the guide will start yelling typically he sees them first because he's a little bit higher on the platform and and the guy who's casting would would be up on the bow of the boat and he'll yell like tarpon tarpon uh you know two o'clock so you know the nose of the boat's always at like noon so you point your rod till two o'clock he's like okay he's moving left to right or right to left he's at 100 yards do you see him and now man he's like your heart is just like about to jump out of your chest like it's just racing (laughs) it goes from like zero to a hundred like that and and you can practice casting as much as you want, but it's like, you know, once you get into the game, I mean, things change and uh, the adrenaline and, and the guides positioning the boat and, and it's so important to make a good cast. Like if you cast over that fish, you've lined him and he's gone. But if you cast, you know, too short, you won't see your fly. But I mean, to experience a hookup on, on like a dry fly with, with a tarpon and, and you put it in the right spot and the guide's yelling, bump it bump it and you're slowly pulling that fly it's moving and you see that tarpon turn and he comes and inhales it it's like man just clear the line like get your feet off of any loose line you have because this thing is just going to start to smoke and uh i mean i've had runs with these tarpon where my reel is actually hot because it's been moving so fast you can barely touch it so to me that's if i had to pick one that would probably be the one, but I mean, oh, geez, it, it is tough. Like I, I love all kinds of fishing. The the art form of it is is what I'm learning to appreciate the older I get. And I wanted to ask you about, you know, because hockey to me is also an art form or any sport really. And the expertise and the things that are done in, in any sport, especially at such a high level like you were at, how would you say, is fishing very similar to that in, in in the technique, the art form of it, and trying to master it—is it similar to sports? Yeah, there's a lot of similarities or parallels. Like um, again, kind of depending on what species you're fishing for. I mean, there's some species where you know it's just kind of brute strength. Like if you're fishing for you know these big white sturgeon in British Columbia, they kind of live in the Fraser River. They're the largest freshwater fish in North America, and 
you know, sometimes these fish get up to, you know, 12, 14 feet, over a thousand pounds. And when you hook yeah. a big fish like that, or even a fish that's 500 pounds, it's, you know, it, it's kind of just a test of, uh, of will and, and, and who's going to break down first, you or the fish. <laughs> so that's, you know, a lot of times you compare that to kind of the, uh, the physicality of playing sports and, 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 you know, uh, you know, not letting your opponent kind of physically get the best of you, things like that. But then there's other things like, you know, take fly fishing, for example, where, you know, fly fishing can be, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, probably the purest form of fishing where, um, there's a lot of minutia and details that go into, you know, knowing like entomology of like bugs and hatches and, you know, the, the big saying in fly fishing, match the hatch. And I mean, you could have the right fly, but if you have a color that's off slightly, that fish isn't going to eat it. So that's where it's important to, you know, adjust and, and kind of be able to change on the fly, kind of think on your feet and 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 be technical i was just thinking about you know the the passion of, of of fishing and a lot of the guests i've had on the podcast have talked about how you know they had a passion for either racing or diesel trucks or even just being an entrepreneur and a question that a lot of people will ask when they haven't quite done it yet they're thinking about it in their mind is how do i take a passion and turn it into a career. And I wanted to ask you how you've taken or some advice that you would give to people to take this passion you have for the outdoors and the wilderness and for fishing and be able to turn it into something that you're dedicating your, your time to now and something that you're, you're, you're using, you know, every day to, you know, keep challenging yourself and also to, you know, take, uh, you know, people on fishing trips and, and do these different things. How do you, how did you do that? How did you combine that passion with making it a, a career? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things that go into it. One, I, you know, I've always kind of been a believer that if something's important to you, then you find the time to do it. You know, whether I was a young kid growing up playing hockey, I mean, you know, it's just something I love to do. It was a passion of mine. It was, I never viewed it as work. It's just something that, hey, I want to be out here every day as long as I can until my parents call me inside and it's time for bed. And, uh, that that's that was my approach so when when you're enjoying something and you're having fun doing it i also believe it's it's easier to work hard right if you go to work or you know you go to school or you're you're going to uh, in my case the, the ice arena every day and if you know you're, you're a little bit down or you're not enjoying what you're doing well man is it ever tough to kind of get motivated to work hard but when you're enjoying it and you're loving it it's easier to work hard so so for me you know, I think those two things and then, you know, just really, you know, having, you know, confidence in yourself and the belief that, you know, you know, what you, what you want to do is the right thing or, or you, you kind of stay true to what you believe. And I think people respect that, right? Like, you know, you're not trying to be somebody you're not. I mean, we were trying to invent the, the wheel when we started Real West Coast. It was, okay, how, how can we take something that we love to do? And really kind of uh, share our experiences and our passion with other people and try and encourage other people to get outside and enjoy the same thing. And, that, and that's kind of the approach we took to it. So, I mean, there, there's been a lot of great fishing shows out there that uh, have been around a long time. And, and again, our approach to it was we wanted to try and capture the whole picture of the adventure. You know, not just, okay, here's another fish, boom, boom, here's another fish. Let's, let's show like, you know, the adventure of getting there. Let's show when we get there. Let's talk about some of the, the surrounding area. Let's show the location that we're, that we're in and, and being able to experience. And I think, you know, people have appreciated that. And, and I know it's something that, you know, I think as time goes by, you put more stock into as well. When you're young and a little bit naive, those things don't really come into your mind as often, I don't think. But as you get older, you, you do start to appreciate, I guess, the small things a little bit more. That's what really stuck out to me about the, the show is the adventure side of it and the just the driving, towing, getting the boat ready, launching it, the, the equipment. And that was going to be the next thing I asked you is how, how does equipment or the things that you need to do these adventures, how do they factor into how successful you may 
be, say, on a fishing trip or, or, or may not? How important is choosing the right tools enabling you to have, say, a successful, you know, a successful trip to catch a sturgeon or catch uh, a salmon or, or whatever it is you may be, may be going for that day? Yeah, like, like I think the, the gear or the equipment that, you know, allows you to go on these adventures is a vital part of it. I mean, we, we've been um, very fortunate to have some amazing sponsorship. And, and, and this doesn't happen without sponsorship and guys kind of believing in your messaging and, and standing beside you and, and uh, you know, uh, supporting kind of your vision. And, and uh, a lot of times for us, like when we're in BC here, um, you know, we have long commutes. I mean, we live in a big province. Some of it's very remote. And talking about sponsorship and partners, you know, we, we're, we're very lucky to be affiliated with BD Diesel. And, and what they've brought to the table for us is, has helped us immensely as far as things like towing our boat. You know, like when you're towing a large uh, 30-foot Kingfisher aluminum boat, I mean, that's, that's a big package, right? And you add your engines on, we got awesome Mercury engines and, you know, you got some fuel in there. Next thing you know, you're towing something that's, you know, 10, 11, 12,000 pounds. And, uh, to have the, um, the relationship with BD Diesel and, and their technology that goes into their trucks just makes our towing of that boat to get to places that much easier. I mean, you feel safe, you feel confident. We have, you know, acceleration, stopping, all that stuff where sometimes you, you don't think about it and then you, you get introduced to it and you're like, oh my God, this is a game changer. Like on Vancouver Island, there's a lot of tight, windy logging roads. So response is a big part of it. And, you know, that's just added so much to, to us uh, being able to get into a lot of these locations. And it's been awesome. It's one of the things about, I think, the western part of, of the continent is just how different the terrain is. And this, whether it's mountain passes, steep grades, different kind of challenges you have towing a, a boat or trailer. And no matter who I've talked to that has a diesel truck, it could be a brand new one with you know the latest and greatest power ratings, is once they get into the mountains, it's like, I, I want a little bit more. I need a little bit more. I, I, I noticed the difference, you know, being on flat ground and towing it versus heading up to 10 or 11 or 12,000 feet over a pass. And, and I wanted to ask you with your truck, one is what, uh, what year and make truck do you have? So the, the truck that we primarily use on our show is a, a, two, yeah. a 2012 Ram 3,500 that has a 6.7 liter Cummings engine in it. And when you were, when you were thinking about a, a truck to tow your equipment with, did you know right away, hey, I want to get a Ram Cummins, or did, did uh, you know, you look at the, the different brands, or what drew you to that particular model? So, to be honest with you, it was kind of just uh, BD Diesel, you know, and, and them uh, allowing us to have access to some of the vehicles that they have. So we like me personally at home here. I have uh, I have a Chevy thirty five hundred. And uh, I have a TS booster in there, which we can get into talking about that. But the, the, the main truck that we use for towing our boat, yeah, it has, it's that Ram and it, it's equipped with uh, like SXE Cobra twin turbos. And like you're, you're talking about when you're going over little passes and you have, you know, some inclines. And I mean, there is zero like bog down at all. Like uh, it just, it, it, until you actually experience it, it, it it's hard to kind of uh, put into words. But there's there's no difference essentially between you know towing something 10, 11, 12,000 pounds behind you and not towing anything when you have the right equipment. And that's exactly what we have with BD. It's it's really interesting too when you get like uh, it could be a new truck or just, just something, and you're driving it and you think it's great, and and you might tow something with it, and then one of your buddies or or somebody says, hey you know, come, come take my truck around the block and they have, you know, some upgrades to it. And it's like, well, this is a whole different vehicle. I want this. I need this. I, I need to use this to, to tow my trailer, tow my boat. And that, that experience is, is always really interesting to watch or hear people's feedback. So when you went from, you know, see that truck was stock to you did the TS booster and, and the turbo kit, was it just like a night and day difference? Like these trucks should come with this from the factory. Like, this is awesome. Like, honestly, you know, uh, 
I never grew up like with diesel trucks and that. I got into them a little bit more when I got into more of this outdoor life with, with fishing, a little bit of hunting and things like that. But so not, you know, being a, a, a novice essentially to it and seeing the difference and, and not having any preconceived notions or anything, it's a complete 180 from what your like a stock truck is to having some of these uh upgrades on your truck i mean it, it's it's incredible i mean that's really how i can put it i mean it, it's uh it's uh, it's a game changer i mean it really is i mean safety wise re response wise you know all that stuff combined i mean it's a no-brainer to have this stuff on your truck if you're you know looking for that kind of adventure lifestyle or if you're towing heavier loads etc it, it's it's a no-brainer We've had Brian Roth and Christian Roth on uh, bef on the podcast before, and and they've talked to us about the TS Booster, and, and I've gotten feedback from our listeners as well about about it. And I wanted to ask you what your impression was, not having it on the truck and then installing it. What kind of difference has it made when you're out there with a trailer and you're going, you know, all over BC, all over North America with it? What did it as a driver? What, how did it improve your your experience? Well, one of one of the first things I noticed is just how how simple it was to install. Again, I'm I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not an advanced mechanic by any means or anything like that. And I, actually, I was a little intimidated at first to even uh, attempt to put it on. But I opened it up, read the instructions. I'm like, "Are you kidding me? This thing is like plug and play, man! <laughs> like, pl essentially, it's like plug and play." I'm like, "This is incredible! How did how did they uh, dumb it down that much?" But once I got it installed and uh, yeah, you notice difference, like immediate differences, you, you know, go through the different modes, whether it's, you know, valet or sport and et cetera. And, and uh, uh, like getting up to other, you know, boosts of 300%. I mean, just the response time, right? It's like right now. And that's important, you know, certain times, you know, if you're pulling out or in, into traffic or you're merging or, and all that stuff, it just adds to the whole safety aspect. But again, those, that, that TS booster has been, uh, it's been an incredible invention and uh you know I, I highly recommend it i've used it and the other thing that i've noticed even though it does give you you know a little bit more giddy up and some power is it's more fuel efficient i mean it, it's just genius how how uh you know brian and, and christian and the, and the team at bd have, have come up with this and do you have it on both the ram and on your silverado 3500 yeah we we have it on both yeah yeah is the is the feedback that you get on both on, on each platform is it the same? So whether somebody's got a Silverado or or a Ram, the the the, the improvements are, are are identical between the two. Yeah, and that's a great question because you wonder what, what the difference is between different uh, makes of, of of trucks, and you know I haven't experienced both. I mean, they're the same across across the board. Like, there's no difference. So no matter what type of truck or vehicle you have, um, you know, even cars for that matter. It, it, it's just uh yeah it's uniform and that's 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 part of the the brilliance behind it it's a really interesting connection too between diesel trucks and and the outdoors is you know, with my experiences you know my dad had a he had a he wanted to buy a boat and his half ton wouldn't tow it so he bought a power stroke and he would tow it and then it was basically the same kind of thing like i need a little bit more and that's when he got into you know some upgrades for it and there's a lot of our listeners that say the same thing is they, they use their truck either for work or recreation and they need a little bit more to tow things or do things that are really their passion, which a lot of, a lot of times it's, it's hunting or fishing or camping and, and those, those sorts of things. So the connection is really interesting to me. And I know a lot of our listeners are going to connect with that particular part because they're looking to get a, just a little bit more, a little bit more efficiency, a little bit more response so they can go out there and you know, hunt or fish or whatever it might be. Yeah. And, and I think that another big thing for me is you're right about that is, you know, again, kind of being a bit of a novice to, you know, superchargers and, and, and engines and all that, there maybe is a bit of an intimidation factor at first, right? You're like, oh, like, you know, yeah. where do I go? Where, what do I look at? What do I need? And the thing that BD Diesel is great at is when you talk to them, I mean, they really explain things to you in simple terms and, and they've come up with products that are like the TS Booster, for example, that are 
I mean, you cannot get anything easier to put into your, it's like plugging in your iPhone charger, really. Like, I mean, it's that simple. Um, so, you know, if you have questions or you're uncertain about certain things, uh, you don't just really, really know what you need or what you could use. I mean, these guys are awesome at explaining exactly, you know, what, which one of their products would, would suit your needs. Right. And, and that's, uh, again, it's just getting over the fact of, of, of the intimidation of not really knowing, but I mean, these guys will help educate you and, and just put you at ease with, with what you need. That's one of the really fun parts of this podcast is I mean, we've been doing it for a really long time and I definitely don't know everything. I, there's so much information that I get intimidated sometimes, especially on newer trucks where there's so many things that are on there, so many electronic components and all this stuff. It's just like, I, I'm kind of intimidated. And so to be able to talk with, with people, like I, I'd asked Christian a bunch of questions about turbos once and just to be able to have that information be made simple to where I could understand it, our audience could understand it, and we're not so intimidated because we're bombarded with information all the time. You need to run this product or that product or, you know, this is going to make your truck fantastic, but it might not depending on your use. Not everybody's trying to, you know, go fast or make a certain power number. Sometimes we're just, we need to be able to tow over a pass and keep our EGTs in control. And so I think being able to make things simple and relatable is so important, especially on these trucks because they're, they're expensive and we want to protect that investment and we want it to last a long time. Yeah, you're right. Like, uh, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it's like, a, it's a, you know, like you said, it's a big investment. It's a lot of money yeah. buying a new vehicle, you know, even depending on your situation, even a used vehicle for some people, whatever the, I mean, everything's relative, but you know, you're always learning things like, I mean, you talk about for me and, and this being kind of a new area with, with, uh, with the diesel and, and the superchargers, et cetera. And, you know, even with, you know, we can relate that to fishing. I mean, every time I go on the water, I, I learn something, you know, whether, you know, certain guys, uh, you know, fish salmon, you know, it's the same species, but everybody has their little, uh, intricacies that they like to do differently or, 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 and you always are trying to pick up what that is. And, and even again, relate that to hockey when I played. I mean, you guys come into your team or every summer somebody's trying a new move or whatever it is, you're always learning. I mean, even the last day I played professionally, I was still learning. So, I mean, that's the cool thing about this is, is this kind of, uh, you know, this, this journey of, of, of life, I guess, that we're, we're all on as, as we get older is, I mean, we're always learning and you got to have an open mind and, and uh, guys like uh, Brian and Christian and the team at BD, they just put you at ease and they make you feel comfortable and, and it doesn't, you don't feel like you've asked a dumb question or anything, right? I mean, it's just like, hey, listen, uh, we'd love to help you out. What are you looking for? Uh, you know, you understand that they kind of have the expertise and they're going to point you in the right direction. I think that's the, the part where I get most intimidated with is fishing because like, you know, I know how to do it on a basic level, but when I'm watching some of your videos and some of the things you guys are doing, I'm like, that seems like 40 steps ahead of where I'm at. And I wanted to kind of bring it back to the, the outdoor fishing part for a second is if somebody out there is listening and they, they understand what we're talking about with the, the disconnecting and the release and, and almost just the therapy of being outdoors, but they're kind of intimidated. They're intimidated by, you know, I, I don't know how to fish for this species, or I don't know if I'm doing this right, or maybe I don't have the equipment yet. W what do I do? How would you suggest somebody proceed if they want to invest more of their personal time into the outdoors and, and fishing what should they what should they look for how should they make the decisions on or maybe not make the decision but just not be intimidated by what they don't know yeah well i think one thing is, is you know just go into your local tackle shops and these guys in there from from all of my experiences whether it's been you know, here in, in, uh, in like in Alberta or British Columbia, up in Canada, or from traveling in the U S you know, these guys want to help people. They, they want to, they want to encourage people to get on the water and they want, they want to encourage them to be successful. So, you know, we talking about certain, um, you know, t whether it's times a year that you should be fishing, you know, at that time of year, you know, what kind of setup you should have. You know, uh, if you're fly fishing, are you, you know, is it dry fly season or is there going to be a hatch or, or are we nymphing? Um, 
you know, whatever it is. But uh, the other the other thing that I think is key, and, and I know everybody can't do this because, it, it you know, it, it's, it can be a, a cost, an extra cost involved. But I think if you're in a position where you can hire a guide in an area that you want to spend time, I think that is so valuable. You know, if, if you uh, are going to go fish a river uh, for say, for trout, for example, and, and you're going to, you know, maybe go with a buddy and, and you know, what, what's a guide? Five, four to six hundred dollars maybe for the day. You guys split it two ways. But that investment right there can really uh, shorten your learning curve or, or, or steepen your learning curve, I guess. Um, not steepen, sorry. <laughs> They'll go the other way. Flatten your learning curve because... The amount of information you can learn from a guide a whole day out on the water, I mean, you might not be able to accumulate that in a year going out by yourself. And you can you can relieve a lot of frustration and, and just these guides are dialed in, they're on the water more than anybody, that's what they're doing, and they just get right to the point. This is this is what's successful here, this is what you need this time of year, or this time of year you need that. So these guys are, are, are dialed in. Now, on the flip side, there is something to be said about you know, kind of figuring things out yourself, right? And the satisfaction of, hey, I, I went out today and, you know, I had an awesome day and, and, and I figured out what these fish were feeding on. And, uh, you know, that's that's gratifying, right? For, for you to be able to, you know, kind of sort through that yourself. But so, you know, just research, man. There's, there's so much uh, information available at our fingertips today. You know, a lot of different... Uh, 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 outlets on social media or websites, etc., and, and just just really trying to educate yourself as much as possible. I think that balance that you mentioned between wanting to do it ourselves and then also relying on help from other people. I'm sure you came across that in hockey, definitely. You know, with fishing and, and with your truck, is just to be able to to have that ambition to want to do something yourself, but then also understanding there's people that have been doing it for a long time and have learned the lessons and to be able to take that valuable knowledge that they have to be able to speed up that learning process is probably critical, not just in fishing, but, you know, modifying your truck or professionally as, as you did. Well, absolutely. I mean, I remember, you know, I was drafted by the New Jersey devils and I went into my first training camp and, uh, you know, I, I walk into the locker room and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're playing against like Scott Stevens, Marty Broder, Dave Andrichuk, Doug Gilmore, all these guys who, you know, <laughs> went to the Hockey Hall of Fame and you come in as a young rookie and you're like, you know, you kind of kind of catch yourself instead of, uh, you know, staring at these guys and watching them. I mean, you got to understand you're competing against them and, and, and trying to earn a job to, to play with them. And, uh, you know, that's all part of the process, right? It's no different than fishing. You go out you know, again, uh, early, early, maybe in, in your fishing career, and you're just trying to, you know, kind of sort things out, figure things out, you may be beside a guy in another boat or standing beside a guy on, on the river or, or in the in the lake who's hammering fish, and you're not getting anything. It's, it's part of the evolution of, of, uh, of learning and understanding the process. And then once you kind of get some confidence and, and, and uh, you know, a little bit of belief in yourself that, hey, I can do this, then, you know, it just kind of takes off. I wanted to ask you more about Real West Coast and what you guys have planned for, for this year. I'm sure that the last year there were a ton of challenges that existed with you know the pandemic and, and those sorts of things. But you guys are always on the, the cutting edge of delivering amazing content. And any episode I watch, like I'm engrossed in it. I, I stop what I'm doing and I watch the whole thing. It's not on in the background. So I was curious as a fan is what are some things you guys are looking to do this year that I can tune into and keep my eye out for? Yeah, well, we're, uh, we're entering into season five here of, of Real West Coast. And, you know, I, I've been, again, very fortunate to, to uh, have a situation where, you know, a, a good friend of mine is, is, is also our cameraman. He's our producer. He's our editor. He's kind of, he kind of does it all. And, and Mike Bemister just, you know, he, he's, he's got to be one of the best in the business at, at the way he kind of tells the story and, and, and edits it. And, and it just flows for the audience. And I, you know, I'm so fortunate to, to have him and, you know, be a part of Real West Coast. But, uh, you know, for us, we, you know, we, we try to, we try to change things up a little bit every year uh, as far as our locations, you know, um, up until last year, we've always tried to go to, uh, 
you know, a, a travel location, whether that be, you know, out of Canada, you know, we've gone up to Alaska, we've, we've been to Hawaii, we've been to Belize, we've been down to Mexico. So, you know, obviously things have changed with, with uh, the pandemic and, and travel protocols, but so we'll, we're, we're pretty focused on Canada and, and, and you know, mainly uh, Western Canada and British Columbia. We do a ton of um, uh, ocean fishing there, saltwater for salmon, you know, halibut, lingcod, albacore tuna as well. On, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And uh, we get into fly fishing, some still water stuff. We've done some river fly fishing, some still heading. So just, uh, I mean, we're so so lucky in British Columbia and, and uh, in Western Canada with just the, uh, the different species of fish and the area that you can fish. So, you know, we've had some chats this year about maybe going north in, in BC a little bit, targeting some different areas that we haven't been to for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, just keep keep things fresh man like uh you know we get some feedback from viewers of of, of where you know they would like to, to see us go fish um you know a lot of people like to see stuff that's real local that's uh you know real close and accessible to them and then other people like to see us when we go away to to lodges and things like that so i think the key is just to have a good mix you know under really uh have that interaction with your fan base and 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 uh you know kind of get an idea of, of what they enjoy and what they like to watch and and uh and go from there i mean we're just in the process of, of putting together our, our 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 shoots this year um again you know you got to be flexible right now because of all the different criteria with the pandemic we don't really know exactly what's going to happen i don't think anybody knows exactly what's going to happen so um you know a lot of it's timing you know, we got to have windows open where, you know, hey, there's good weather. Hey, the fish have shown up. Boom. We got to make a move and get there. So, you know, uh, flexibility is good when, you, when you're trying to, to schedule things out. Uh, but yeah, man, we're excited about this year. I mean, when we started this, we didn't really know how it was going to go. But into our fifth year now, we've got a tremendous following on social media, on television, and it's been a lot of fun. Now, for our listeners out there that maybe have not seen your show and they're interested, they love fishing, they've heard us talk, and they want to check you out, where's the best place to be able to find your show? Well, I, I think we, we'd love for people to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Real West Coast. We put all, all of our content up on, uh, on YouTube. Um, that's one of our big platforms. We're also on uh, Facebook and Instagram, on social media. And then streaming-wise, we... Uh, we got onto Amazon Prime last year, and we're also on Waypoint TV. So those would kind of be the main, uh, the, the main channels that would be, uh, I guess, across North America, if you will. And, and we're on some more local channels in, in, in British Columbia and, and, and across Canada, um, Czech TV and uh, Wild TV. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where it's at. But yeah, get on YouTube, man, and, and subscribe to Real West Coast and uh, get, some, get entertained with, some, with uh, some adventurous fishing content. Oh, yeah, it's awesome stuff. On that, we'll make sure, it, you know, when we, when we uh, post up to have people go check you guys out and, and see it. It's, like I said, I, I watch as many episodes as I can sometimes. More, <laughs> sometimes I watch them more than once. <laughs> Well, and we, I, we I jot down some that. notes <laughs> <laughs> where where I need to go and uh, and do some fishing. And I know, I know you're a busy guy, but before you go, as a hockey fan, I've got to just ask you one question. I was thinking about this once I you know once we were gonna have you on here, and I'm just a fan, but I'm curious, well, who were some of the toughest goaltenders that you ever played against? Yeah, well, I, I, man, there's so many good goaltenders, but you guys had a great one there in, in Colorado for a lot of years in, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, Patrick Waugh. And uh, I know Colorado knocked my team, Vancouver, out of the playoffs in, uh, in 2001 and went on to win the Stanley Cup that year. And that was, uh, they had a Hall of Fame team with, you know, Sackick and Forsberg and Ray Bork, of course, who came yeah. over from Boston and, and won the Cup in his final year. Uh, so Patrick Waugh's right up there, you know, played with Marty Brodeur in, in Jersey. He's one of the all-time greats. Uh, Dominic Hasek was always uh, a, a difficult goaltender to play against. He was just so unorthodox in the net. Um, one of my teammates in Vancouver, uh, Roberto Luongo, 
I mean, he he put together a couple performances that may have been the best goaltending I've ever seen in a, in a single game. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say the I mean those those guys there. That's a pretty good list. Yeah, it was always really fun to watch hockey in like the mid '90s and on. And as I mentioned, you know, in the beginning, is not not being exposed to hockey, and then all of a sudden there's this team here and. Yeah, we all kind of jumped on board and the battles they'd have with Detroit. And then there was Dallas. And I remember Vancouver and how tough Vancouver was and just some of those players and everything. It, it, uh, it's an amazing sport and it's, it's something that, uh, I still appreciate. And, and, uh, you know, like I, I said before, when we had the opportunity to have you on, I was super excited, not just for that, but for what you do with, with the TV show and fishing and your insights into it. And I appreciate you taking the time and giving us some really good content and some some tips and advice whether we're towing or fishing or looking to just you know connect with nature and just kind of de-stress and i know that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be interested and are going to you know click over and and start watching some of your shows and and i'm sure some people they're going to have questions about the ts booster and some of the other things you got on your trucks and they'll really give bd a call and and find that out but it was uh it was a pleasure to have you on and uh Definitely appreciate your time and, and all the, the great information that you gave us. Well, Patrick, thanks for having, having me, man. It was, uh, it was a blast. I'm glad we could do it. Uh, yeah, I got to talk about uh, all three of your favorite subjects and a few of my favorite subjects as well. So like we said, it was, it was a hat trick here. So a lot of fun to do it, man, and, and maybe we can do it again in the future. Don't forget, Diesel fans, make sure and go to the YouTube app on your phone and search Real West Coast. It's R-E-E-L West Coast. Subscribe and make sure you click the notification button so you can see when they release new episodes. If you're anything like me, love the outdoors, you're going to go back to season one if you've never watched the show and you're going to watch them all the way through and probably a few episodes you're going to watch more than once just to see the amazing, the fish, the techniques, the insights that they have. We encourage you to do that and also follow them on Instagram and Facebook as well. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.